Internet people, and welcome back to Green Wing Gaming, or welcome if you're new. If this is your first time on the channel, this is a Friday upload, and Fridays on this channel, we like to play tabletop games. And so today, we are continuing through our playthrough of Rangers of Shadow Deep. We're hopefully going to start getting around to finishing off the Burning Light mission pack, which is what we've been doing the last few weeks. So today, we've actually hit the midpoint. Uh, this will be our fifth scenario in, the in, the, in this mission pack. There are four behind us. There's another four ahead of us. So this is the middle mission, or mi middle scenario. Uh, so if you, if you are feeling a little weird about jumping into the middle of, of a kind of ongoing story, don't worry, we do have a, a playlist over on the main channel. You can just, uh, I believe... I believe Burning Light starts with with episode 12, but if you want to watch all, all the way from the beginning, I'm not going to stop you. But you're also more than welcome to just keep watching the, here and, and, enjoy, and enjoy the fact that you might not have all the context. But that's okay, because Rangers of Shadow Deep is still a load of fun to watch. I, I know I've been having an absolute blast filming these games for you guys, and judging by the comments, you've been having some fun watching them, so on we, we carry. Uh, to quick recap of last week's scenario, we did the herb store uh, scenario, which was kind of a mixed bag. Of, we did very well, managed to get to all of our uh, investigation markers. Damien did get taken down to one wound, uh, so he'll be starting off this scenario at six wounds. Although, uh, I, I did forget that between scenarios, you can make a survival roll. Uh, so if Tywin can pass a survival roll of, I think it's 12 or more, he can, uh, we can pop an extra two wounds onto Damien. Uh, other than that, there wasn't a lot to report. We found a few items here and there. Uh, you know, Damien's going to have an item that gives him some better armor. Tywin found an item that will give him better health. Uh, but all in all, we didn't really find any clues as to the whereabouts of the decanter, except for the fact that the, the, during the mission, there was a random, like a scenario specific event card that had Tywin receive a vision of the decanter. So I'm tempted to say that it might be in the herb store, but I want to go ahead and play through the other scenarios just to make sure, just to see if there isn't something else we're missing out on. Uh, but other than that, the other thing, other thing that I do need to to mention is that uh, once again, one of you, one of you guys in the comments very politely uh, pointed out that I had actually once again gotten the Shadow Deep table a bit wrong. Uh, this time I did remember to include the cards, but I included too many because when I read the rules and it said you need to include two new cards every week, I thought that meant you had to like add two cards in addition to all the other ones you'd already accrued, meaning by the time we played the last scenario, I had six Shadow Deep cards in, in, in the rotation. Yeah, you're only ever supposed to have two, and you're just supposed to rotate out which two you're using. I promise I actually can read. I, I'm not that much of a dum-dum, uh, but I do appreciate you guys uh, helping me sort that out. So this week, there will only be two Shadow Deep cards. Uh, I did feel a little bad about it because it meant that in the last scenario we had 12 turns when there only should have been eight, uh, which, is, which is a little rough. Uh, but as I went back and, and kind of went through editing the pre last week's video, uh, I, I don't actually think it changed all that much. Uh, the one, really the only consequence uh, was that when Tywin got his vision of the decanter, it might not have actually landed on him because a couple turns earlier, and it would there would have been more uh, characters on the table, so we might have rolled a different person getting it. I don't think that's that big of a deal. Tywin's going to start off with with more wounds than he otherwise would have, but it's I think it works out narratively very well. And uh, as for all of the. Uh, dark roots that we ended up killing, you could argue, oh, isn't that farming XP? Well, actually, no, because the dark roots weren't worth any XP. The, the vines themselves didn't award any XP. Only the actual body plant did, and we got him before turn eight. So, uh, other than that, yeah, that, that's about all there is to, to correct from last week. As for what we're doing this week, we are going into scenario B, which is a little weird considering we just did E, but we're going into scenario B, the ruined chapel, because I have no idea where else to look, and I figured, why not that one? Um, but yeah, so I've already got that, that board set up for that, and it should be a lot of fun. Um, 
I am a little worried that this might be a harder one than usual, but we'll have to wait and see when we get into the game. Uh, other than that, there's not much else to report. So before we hop into the scenario, I would just like to remind you guys that this channel is pretty young and we could do with all the support that, that you can offer. You've already done me a huge favor just by clicking on this video, but if you can watch as far into the video as you're possibly willing to do, I'd really appreciate it. Also, liking and subscribing really help out. And another casual reminder to just leave a comment down below. Don't even think, I, I, as far as I can tell, it's not actually helping my engagement at all, but I love talking to you guys in the comments. Genuinely never, I, I, it feels kind of cheesy every time I say it, never had a bad interaction in the comments section. You guys have been pretty lovely so far, so oddly enough, I'd like to hear more from you. Uh, but with all, and, and just to be clear, you don't even have to have anything super relevant to say, just let me know if you're enjoying the campaign or not. Uh, it's, al it's always nice to hear if, if I should be continuing on with this. But with all that being said, all that obligatory self-promotion out the way, yeah, nothing else to, to really go over. So we're playing scenario B of the Burning Light mission. So let's just get into it. All right. And so before we get into the scenario itself, I'm going to start with the traditional lore blurb that we like to start off with, with scenario B, the Ruined Chapel. This tower once stood four floors high, but now only a few fragments of the second level remain. It looks like a giant fist punched straight through one corner of the tower and out the opposite one, completely separating the two halves that remain. As you step lightly into the ruins, it is immediately apparent that this must once have been the chapel. There are broken statues, torn prayer books, and, a crush and crushed candles lying all about. There is even one stained glass window, nearly black in the gloom, that has remained untouched. As you step further into the ruins of the chapel, you quickly realize that you are not alone. All right, and so taking a quick look at the table setup, we've got uh, our heroes coming in through one destroyed corner of, of, of the built of the tower, headed towards that other destroyed corner. Or, or at least if we ent if we had entered the convent this way, that is how it would play out. That we'd be kind of coming this way, entering the convent, headed towards the, the other corner. As it, uh, since we've already entered the convent, we can just say that we're coming in from the courtyard and clearing out this place just to look for clues and stop ghouls from sneak up, up behind us. But yeah, so we've got some kind of fallen debris, destroyed uh, pews, some random statues, uh, uh, just kind of generic chapel type stuff, a lectern, uh, uh, an altar, a little... Uh, votive uh, resting place over here. Now, the actual stats for the scenario state that the, the heroes are meant to start in this corner. The board is meant to be two and a half feet by two and a half feet, so 30 inches by 30 inches. Um, there's supposed to be like a four by four room. This room is actually not four by four. Uh, I ended up making it just slightly larger than that just because well, an actual four by four room was incredibly tiny and I didn't really know what to do with that. So I made it a little bit bigger. I don't think it'll make that big of a difference. But in terms of enemies, we have a couple of regular old ghouls coming up front. And then up on the actual kind of altar where we're up on the kind of... Uh, oh man, all those years growing up Catholic and I, for, and I uh, have forgotten what the term for where the altar is. Uh, if my mother could see me now. But anyways, up here by the altar, we have a pair of larger ghoul fiends who are going to have hit with a bit of a heavier punch, hence why I've given them giant halberds, but that's really just for show. They don't get the plus two damage for a two-handed weapon. And then in the back, these are some kind of slight... You'll notice that these ghouls are a little bit larger than the regular ones and have slightly better paint jobs because the uh, smaller ghouls are just ones I found pre-painted on eBay. Whereas these ghouls are ones I painted myself. They're from the War Cry. Uh, oh God, what's it called? The Royal Beast Flayers uh, gang or, or kit. Uh, I, I, the weird thing is, I actually don't play War Cry. Uh, I don't play Age of Sigmar at all. I don't play anything in that rule set because I don't particularly like the Age of Sigmar rule set. But even I have to admit, the Age of Sigmar minis may well be the greatest minis Games Workshop has ever come out with, hence why they make up so many of the bad guys for this campaign. But with all that being said, we've got a total of one, two, three, four investigation markers. This little thing set up in the corner is meant to symbolize like a ledge hanging down from what little remains of the second floor of this tower. 
And uh, yeah, we'll have a total of eight turns to see if we can't find anything of note in this ruined chapel. But with all that being said, I will see you guys just as soon as we start the first turn. All right, guys, we are getting started into turn one. And as I was getting ready to start filming this, I was a little worried that maybe I'd forgotten some like super special rules for this scenario. But unlike a lot of the other scenarios in this mission pack, there actually aren't really any special rules for this one. The only real special rule is that our player characters can only leave the table via the corners with the, uh, the like smashed in walls. So yeah, other than that, not really a whole hell of a lot to remember for this scenario. Just move your people to the investigation markers and see what's what and try our best to deal with these enemies. Um, having said that, we are gonna go ahead and hop into the ranger phase where Oh, oh, actually, hold on. We still haven't done the survival roll we were supposed to do at the end of the last scenario. So Tywin here is going to try to make a quick survival roll, see if we can't buff Damien up wounds-wise a little bit. So target number 12, I believe Tywin has a plus 3 to this. And he cranks a 14, so Damien is going to be starting off with 8 wounds rather than 6. So that is good news, I suppose, if you like Damien. Uh, but yes, so now that, we, now that we've gotten that out of the way, the question does become what to do next. And so we are going to go ahead and have Tywin group activate. We're definitely group activating with Bryn. The question becomes who else to group activate with. Uh, and I think the answer is Damien? Yeah, I can't really see a reason to activate with anybody else. So we're going to start off by activating with Bryn here, who are our musket-wielding madman, who actually did pretty solid work in the last scenario, is going to dial up a shot into this ghoul over here, because he looks thoroughly shootable. So we've got our first attack of the game. Bryn will be having his normal shoot plus two. I believe of ghouls are just fight plus one. So let's see what that looks like. Oh, oh dear. Uh, oh dear. Uh, it's, it's not good, guys. It's not good. Uh, Bryn has opened up with a 5. With a plus 2, that becomes a total of 7. Focus camera. And uh, our enemy has rolled a natural 20. First roll of the, of the game for the baddies. That doesn't bode well for us. Oh well. So even though it's not time to do second actions yet, uh, Bryn's second action, we all know, is going to be to reload. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh no. And so Tywin is faced with a bit of a quandary. Um, what to do, what to do. Okay, so what we're going to end up doing... Let's see. Tywin is, oddly enough, going to pop his once per game dash ability, which is one of his heroic abilities that, oddly enough, I think this is one he took all the way from the beginning. And he's gonna do that because nine inches gets us to about here within an inch of the enemy. And then according to the rules of the game, Rangers, uh, Shadow Deep creatures must snap into combat if they are close enough to do so. So Tywin is gonna go ahead and get himself into combat with the <laughs> creature that dodged out of the way of a bullet. So yeah, so as our heroes have, are slowly creeping their way into this dank, dripping, ruined chapel, uh, the, the air of the, of, of the Shadow Deep thick around them, uh, they start to notice these, these terrifying, flesh-eating ghouls start to poke their heads out between the rubble and Damien, or Bryn, being, being the nervous Nelly that he is, just levels his musket the first thing he sees and busts off a shot. And Tywin, now realizing that the enemy has been fully alerted to their presence, dashes forward to get uh, to try and down some of, his, his, some of the, these baddies before they can uh, make it to the main group. Uh, Damien, because we now can just, you know, everyone's done their first action, Damien is just going to first action move, which would get him to about here. And then his se second move will get him into combat with the ghoul. So at least Tywin will get his second action to have some gang up bonus. Bryn, as I said, second action is just going to be to to reload his musket and hope to do a little better in the future. But now Tywin's second action is going to be to fight this ghoul. Uh, he should be a total of fight plus six now to a fight of plus one. 
Uh, oh dear. Uh, and our second roll for the goodies has been a, a two, which is going to be a total of an eight. Not enough to do any damage to the ghoul. He does win the fight, uh, but there's not a whole lot of point in him uh, dropping, uh, of him pushing the creature back because we now just go into the creature phase where oddly enough, the creature... See, again, this is one of those weird things where it feels like I'm gaming the system by having it attack Tywin rather than Damien. So I actually am gonna have it attack Damien. It feels a little weird that Tywin has rushed forward and slashed his sword down at the at the ghoul. But to be fair, Damien is also rushing forward and shield bashing him, so I guess I guess we can justify it that way. But anyway, so the ghoul is gonna be fight plus one to Damien's fight plus four. Let's see if we can't roll a little higher. Okay, it's gone a little better this time. So Damien has rolled a total of a 17, which let me to consult the bestiary real quick. Uh, armor 10, health of 10. So the ghoul takes seven wounds and goes down to three. It's a bit of a shame, uh, but we are gonna go ahead and force the ghoul back uh, because we can. Uh, however, this ghoul over here, being the next closest, is gonna move its... Let's see, does six inches get it into combat with Tywin? Oh yeah, big time. So a six inch move from this ghoul is gonna get it into combat with Tywin. Uh, I don't think Damien was within an inch. No, he's just out. So Damien will not be able to, to snap into combat with the other ghoul. So it's just gonna be Tywin's flat plus five against the ghoul's plus one. Uh, and once again, Tywin does pull out a win, but not rolling super hot. Uh, Tywin has rolled... Oops, come on, camera. Uh, Tywin has rolled himself a 9, where the ghoul rolled an 8, which becomes a 9. So Tywin's total is a 14, which is going to do 4 points of damage and put this ghoul down to 6 wounds. And we are going to force it back an inch just to... Get keep, try to keep thing, any gang ups from happening. So next we're gonna have the ghoul fiends. Who da, da, da. this one's gonna move its total of nine inches, end up like so. This one is gonna do much the same, ending up more like so. Uh, and then the ghoul flingers are gonna start moving in, just to start gaining some line of sight. So. This ghoul flinger is going to move six inches forward and then take a shot at... Uh, Tywin is technically a little bit closer, so it's going to be the ghoul's shoot of... Actually, hold on, let me... I actually have not worked with ghoul flingers before, so let's just real quick look at what that looks like. Sorry, guys. Ghoul flingers have a shoot of plus one. Oh, sorry, ghouls actually have a fight of plus two. Uh, but it it literally doesn't change a thing. So ghouls actually have a fight of plus two. The ghoul flingers have a shoot of plus one. Uh, Tywin's going to have his fight plus five. So let's see if Tywin can survive this. He does. He rolls a four, an eight to the ghoul's four. So the first shot from, from the ghoul... Uh, as, as, as Tywin has rushed into this horde of ghouls and is suddenly being leapt upon, I like to think it, it was, as, I don't know if you guys ever saw Pitch Black, but there's a scene where one of the, the secondary characters lets out a burst of flame by like spitting booze into a, into, a, into a lighter, and there's a bunch of horrible monsters floating around him just, at, just, it, just in the darkness, and they're briefly revealed by the burst of flame. I like to think it's something similar here, where, Damien, where Tywin and Damien have rushed over it, and suddenly a bunch of ghouls have leapt out of every crevice and are just descending on Tywin and Damien from every corner, including a flinger over here kind of rushing forward and just yeeting a ball of, of random debris at, at Tywin, uh, which fortunately has gone sailing over his head, because apparently ghouls are not great at the aim. Uh, this second ghoul is also just going to move six inches, because he genuinely does not have line of sight on Tywin right now, so he's going to move up six inches and can now, oh, actually no, the, 
He only has line of sight on Damien because the ghoul fiend is actually blocking his line of sight to Tywin, so I'm not sure that's actually what we wanted. So the ghoul is going to be shoot plus one against Damien's fight plus three. Uh, unfortunately, it is tied dice. Uh, Damien having the higher fight of plus three. Again, see, you know, uh, seeing that there are now ranged threats approaching from the distance has kind of alerted to the threat. Uh, perks up, sees, sees them incoming, is able to duck under the next ball of random debris hurled his way. Um, but with that being said, that brings us to the end of the creature phase, I believe. Sorry, this guy should have three wounds? Yeah, this guy should have three wounds, not one. I don't know how that got knocked over, but... Now it comes to the companion phase. Uh, <laughs> and I do believe we're going to go for a fireball. <laughs> because so many of our enemies are close together. Da -da -da. Sorry guys, real quick, just rechecking some of our stats here. Probably should have done that before or we were on camera, but oh well. So yeah, we're gonna go ahead and shoot off a fireball from Archibald here. Our angry old man with a torch is gonna shoot off a fireball aiming for about here where his three inch radius will get most of our enemies. I don't believe it'll get this ghoul here, the one with three wounds remaining, but the other three ghouls should all be encompassed in the burst. So yes, Archibald's gonna shoot off his fireball, see if he can't thin this out. If his, with, with a fireball, it's gonna be a shoot plus three, because that's just how this spell works, it just assigns a shoot value. And so the ghoul here is going to have a fight plus two against Archibald's shoot of plus three. Uh, Archibald, ro oh, Archibald rolled himself a six with the plus three is a nine, which is not going to be enough to do any damage. Uh, now the, the ghoul fiends have a fight of plus three and much better armor, so Archibald's going to have to step up his rolls here. So it's going to be another shoot plus three against fight plus three. Okay, here we go. So the baddie, the, that closest ghoul fiend has rolled a two archibald has rolled an 18 becomes a 21 becomes 25 points of damage or no 26 points of damage so let's see the armor on a ghoul fiend is 11 so that's going to be 15 points of damage just enough to kill the ghoul fiend so the fireball comes arcing out of, of uh Archibald's torch, he, he sees that the, the you know, as our two first heroes come rushing forward and the smoke starts to clear, Archibald sees all these menacing shapes closing in around Tywin, extends his torch forward and sends a burst of flame flying forward, misses over, over the head of that first ghoul, blasts fully into the chest of the ghoul fiend behind him, and let's see if he does much the same to the ghoul fiend behind that. A shoot plus three against fight plus three. Uh, okay, that's going to be 25 points of damage, uh, which again will be exactly enough because the uh, the ghoul fiend has an armor of 11 and health of 14, so 25 is exactly what you need to kill it. So just to clarify, Archibald has rolled a 17 with his plus 3 that becomes a 20, then gets the crit bonus for hitting a 20 for another plus 5, exactly enough to kill the second ghoul fiend. Okay, uh, I was a little nervous with how that first roll went, but now that he has, Archibald has single-handedly dropped the two deadliest enemies on the table, or at least the two with the best stat lines on the table, things are looking up. All right, things could be worse. Things could be worse. Good use of a one-off spell. So Archibald has, in fact, sh snapped off his, his fireball spell, and with that done, he is just gonna make a six inch move towards that ledge. And I up like so. And uh, our buddy Bruno is just gonna kind of race ahead of him, keeping him safe. As for the rest of our hero, of our companions, we are gonna have Lady Gwyneth take her full 10 and a half inch move, moving towards that, that doorway. She wants to find, she sees a, a potential for a locked door and of course can't stop licking her lips. Uh, we're going to move Thaddeus up to support Tywin and the, 
the new girl who I've decided to name Eliza, Eliza of the of the Bastion of Saint Amelia, which is the formal name of this convent, is just going to take her double action move and move up behind Damien because she suspects he's going to need her help in the near future. Uh, that is her double move, though. So that does bring us to the end of the companion phase, which means it is time to come to the deck of scary things. So we have drawn ourselves the Red Ace. What does the Red Ace do in this scenario? A ghoul snake slithers out from under the rubbish pile. Place the ghoul snake at a random point adjacent to the pile. So, yeah, I don't really know... Uh, so the rubbish pile is meant to be like the area around this central altar, the central dais that, every, that everything is raised up on. Uh, so we're just going to have the snake pop up like that. So a giant ghoul snake has come slithering out from between the cracks, letting out a, 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 a dry, raspy hiss at, at the living creatures that have dared to disturb its brethren. Uh, so things could be worse, could be better. We'll see if our heroes can, can overcome uh, coming up in the next turn, but I will see you guys there in just a sec. And here we are in turn two, taking a quick sweep of the board where we've got our heroes slowly moving up the table, trying to clear this bottleneck we had going on uh, around this kind of pile of debris leading up to the altar. And uh, yeah, we still got these, the, oddly enough, the regular ghouls have fared better than their much larger, stronger fiend companions. And now we have a uh, snake com coming, at us, coming to deal with us, uh, which I don't really know how to feel about that, but oh well. Uh, but looking at the current state of affairs, going into the ranger phase, we are going to have Tywin group activating again. Uh, and we're going to do it with Damien and Thaddeus. <laughs> the question is how to do it. Tywin is going to pop into combat with this ghoul, which is going to prompt the ghoul on three wounds to snap into combat with him. Damien's first action is going to be to pop in with, with that ghoul. And Thaddeus' first action is going to be to pop in with the other ghoul. So this way Tywin will still be getting his gang up bonus wherever he goes. And Tywin is going to go ahead. And just to be clear, I, I want to make... Uh, this is not something that's come up a lot. Because typically, I, I've uh, up until now, we've always been pretty good about just killing the things that are cl closest to our heroes. Me having the baddies snap into combat, that's not gaming. That's not me trying to like game the system. That's actually what the rules say has to happen. Anytime a hero ends within half an in within an inch of an enemy model, they have to snap to that model. Because uh, that kind of goes just along with how the AI system of this game works, is just that the, the bad guy models are always going to be as aggressive as possible. Like, no exceptions. They will always be aggressive. Which is why they will never force heroes out of combat because they want to stay in combat with you. And they are always going to snap in, even if sometimes it would be beneficial not to. For some of these guys, it would actually probably work out better for them to not snap in, but they do. Because uh, that's just what the rules say. But anyways, so Tywin is going to use his attack. He's going to have a gang up bonus from Thaddeus going into this ghoul with six wounds. And he's going to be fight plus six against fight plus two. Uh, just, and again, clarifying, this other ghoul does not provide, does not negate the gang up bonus because it is also being engaged by Damien. So... So both of the other ghouls are otherwise engaged, even if Tywin isn't there. So because of that, Tywin gets the gang up bonus, but he only gets a plus one. So here we go. Fight plus six against fight plus two. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, the ghoul has rolled another natural 20. <laughs> That's awkward. So yeah, Tywin, even with his plus six, is only going to end up at a 14. So what we're going to do is we're going to activate Tywin's once per game parry ability. Uh, it's another one of his heroic abilities that he's taken. So as Tywin will kind of sees the flames of the fireball Archibald sent off receding, sees the collapsing, smoldering forms of the fiends, he rushes forward looking to finish off the wounded ghoul in front of him, only for it to bash him over the side of the head with, with, with a rock. And as it kind of moves to bite into him, he just barely manages to get his shield up in time, parrying the, the incoming talons of the ghoul as he looks over and sees another one closing in on him from, from the other direction. 
Uh, could be better. Could be better. Uh, so that's going to be both of Tywin's actions done. Oh, I guess we'll have Thaddeus take a go. Why not? No guts, no glory. So oh, let's actually have Damien take his turn first. So Damien is going to take his second action and, uh, and make his attack. He's going to have a fight plus four because of the gang up bonus against a fight of plus two. Uh, okay, it, it could be worse, could be worse. Uh, he ends up getting a total of two damage because his fight plus being plus four right now gets him up to a 12, which is going to be enough to cause two points of damage to the ghoul. Doesn't quite kill it, but does bring it down to one wound. Uh, and then we're going to come over to Thaddeus taking a turn, seeing if he can't roll a little bit higher than his friends here. Fight plus one because of the game bonus against a fight of plus two. Come on. No. So Thaddeus has lost that combat, but his armor is 14, so the ghoul, even with its plus 2, it goes, that goes up to a 10. So Thaddeus does lose the combat, but does not take any damage because the ghoul did not roll high enough. Uh, so he's still the deadliest bird out there, still managed to stay in the fight. Uh, but uh, with all that being said, we have done shockingly poorly against these ghouls. Uh, Tywin, literally, just by virtue of a skin of his teeth deflection with his shield, avoiding taking massive damage, he really, and he, he only barely rolled high enough for the parry to even work, because well, the way the parry works is it just gives you a flat plus 10 to your roll, but it can never result in causing any damage to an opponent, because it's a parry. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that kind of puts him in a situation of, of he just... He, had he rolled even just a little bit lower, the parry wouldn't have saved him. Which uh, is kind of embarrassing, but whatever, moving right along. So as Tywin moves in, just bar barely deflects the, the, the attack, Thaddeus lets out a screech as, it comes in, as he comes in to try and help, only for the ghoul to swat him away with, with, with his arm. Thaddeus just kind of rolling with the hit and, and circling back around to stay in the fight, while Damien kind of thrusts his sword into the belly of, the, of this other ghoul, not quite killing it just yet, but as it squirms on the edge of his, on the point of his blade. Uh, but that will bring us to the compan to the creature phase, where we are going to start, uh, because each of these ghouls is kind of equidistant, we're just going to start with the one that has lower health. He's going to attack Damien, because Damien attacked him, and that's also just how he also has the lower wounds, so yeah. Uh, so it's going to be just a repeat of fight plus four against fight plus two. Okay, Damien finally wakes up, gets himself a total of 23. We don't even need to do the math here. That's going to be a super dead ghoul. So as Damien is twisting the blade, you know, I like to think that he shoved his sword into the ghoul's side. The ghoul has been you know, trying to twist away from that blade, kind of angling around the dip, not, not you know, on the one hand, too aggressive and belligerent to actually pull, off, pull away from Damien, but trying to get itself around the blade that's still stuck inside it. And then when it lunges forward to try and slash at Damien's face with his talons, uh, he instead ends up impaling himself through the heart on Damien's sword, who then kicks him off with, with, with a spit of disgust. But then we do have this other ghoul, who is now going to take a swing at Thaddeus, because Thaddeus has the lower wound count and did just attack him, so I don't have any justification for him not doing so. So fight plus one, fight plus two... Uh, oh no, Thaddeus goes down, uh, because the ghoul has rolled above a 14, so Thaddeus only has the one hit point. So, how, does Thaddeus survive? Yes, Thaddeus rolls a 19 on the out-of-action table. So the ghoul, uh, having enough of this bird's nonsense, sees, sees Thaddeus circling back around uh, to make himself troublesome, and just bats Thaddeus to the ground, who, who's just kind of laying there thinking, oh man, not again. And is just kind of crawling away, hoping that Tywin will pick him up in a moment. Uh, but that brings us to the end of the creature phase. Or no, sorry, no, it doesn't. What am I talking about? There's still a bunch of other creatures. This snake here, for some reason in the, in the stats, the ghoul snake only has a five-inch move, which I think is kind of weird, but oh well. So five inches is actually not enough to get him into combat with anybody. So the snake is going to have to double move to get into combat. And then uh, the ghoul flingers over here are, because they have they, they are the only ghouls that can make shooting attacks, that's what they're gonna do. And they're, 
I have a hard time justifying them flinging any more stuff at the heroes in combat. So this ghoul over here, the one with the bone helmet, the kind of skull helmet, I don't know if you can quite make that out. There you go. The, the ghoul wearing the skeletons of an enemy is going to dial up a shot against Gwyneth here. Now, he is going to be flinging his, his, his weapons over some hard cover, so Gwyneth is going to get a plus two to, to her fight for this against the uh, ghoul flinger's shoot of just plus one. So she's actually got pretty good odds here. And she rolls a natural 20. So yeah, the ghoul ends up with a total of, of 15... Uh, Gwyneth ends up with a 22, so yeah, she easily sees the, the ghoul's incoming attack and, uh, and dodges it. And it, kinda, it doesn't even really necessarily dodge it, dodge, just kind of stays very still, knowing the ghoul's aim isn't good enough to hit her. And so then with its second action, it can't make a second attack, so it's just going to move forward six inches. Um, the other ghoul is going to be in kind of a similar situation where the only really good shot, even kind of good shot against an enemy not in combat is Gwyneth. So, and it's going to be going through two pieces of hard cover, the actual dais itself and that same pillar. So she's going to have a plus four to her shoot to her fight this time. So Gwyneth's fight is going to be plus four right now against a shoot of plus one. Uh, and yeah, this time it's a little, it's a slightly closer run thing. She, with her having a total of a 12 against an 8. So that first attack didn't even get near her. She literally just like stood still, looked at the ghoul, saw its, its chosen brick smash off the, the fallen pillar, kind of lets out a laugh, only to then notice another brick coming at her with much more velocity and tucking underneath it. Uh, but with all that being said, she is going to be just fine. Uh, the snake had to double move just to get into combat. The other ghoul is going to move up because, as I said, we can only make one attack action per turn. So this ghoul is just going to end up like so. Mm. Uh, and with that being said, we're going to go into the creature... F or No, we've just finished the creature phase. We're going to go into the companion phase where Gwyneth, I believe, should be within... A single move of the yes she is within seven her movement of seven is going to be enough to get her to the door which is an investigation marker investigation marker a the small room has only a simple door with no lock as soon as the player opens the door which requires an action c note 792 so gwyneth is going to expand her second action and we're going to hop over to the notes to see 792 do, do, do. Note 792. What does that have for us? 792. Here we go. The room contains a chest sitting in the corner of the, of, of the room. Three ghoul rotters stand in front of this chest. As soon as a hero stands adjacent to the chest, it must make a traps roll. If it fails, a new needle shoots out of the lock and into its hand, and it takes three points of damage and is poisoned. Regardless of whether it succeeds or fails, the trap roll replace the treasure chest with a treasure token. Cool, so we have a room with a treasure chest and three ghouls in it. I'm going to have to put those down in just a second. Uh, but we can move that investigation marker out of the way. Uh, and I guess we can go ahead and remove the doorway, and we'll replace that in just a second. But with that being said, I'm not real sure what to do with our healer. I don't necessarily want to pop her healing spell just yet, because Damien hasn't taken any damage so far in this game. Ugh. I'll tell you what we are going to do. We are going to have Archibald crack off another spell. He's going to send his magic bolt into this ghoul flinger, because I just need there to be fewer baddies with ranged attacks. And the good thing about his magic attack is they do get to ignore the penalties for cover, so that pew would normally provide it with light cover, but not in this case. So his his magic bolt attack will be, I believe, a plus four magic shooting attack against the ghoul's fight of plus one. So let's see if, as Archibald is walking forward and sees more ghoul's shape, shapes kind of fidgeting in the shadows, he, he extends his hand with eldritch lightning dancing between his fingers and sends off a bolt of energy. Rolling a 10, which does become a 15, not enough to kill the ghoul, but he does let, let it know he's there. Cracks off a, a bolt of energy. 
into the ghoul's chest, which does send it kind of slamming to the ground, twitching for a moment before it starts to get up again, ha having uh, uh, some smoke uh, uh, rising from, from the impact marker. But with that being said, Archibald is just going to use his second action to make a six inch move, continuing on towards that rocky ledge, ending up like so, with Bruno again just kind of staying close. With all that being said, Bryn here doesn't have any like amazing options. So I think what we're going to have him do is move up his seven inches. Just going to have him end up more or less like so. Uh, so he's now taking cover behind that pew. He is going to dial up a shot against that ghoul flinger. Now he did move and he is not having magic attack. So it's not, so he is going to take a penalty for moving and shooting, but he's no longer giving cover, insane amounts of cover to that wounded ghoul flinger. So he's going to have, still going to have his shoot of plus two, but the ghoul flinger is now going to count as fight plus two. So it is going to be dice even as he has finally just finished ramming home the, uh, a new, uh, fresh round in, into the chamber and levels his musket looking, looking to, <laughs> do a little bit better this time so he does not he does not uh, uh, apparently he rests the barrel of his musket down on on the pew and it crumbles underneath him just as he's pulling the the, the trigger and the shot completely ranges wide with his total of a four against the ghoul's 20 uh we've seen better and i still don't really know what to do with our healer uh, I guess she is going to pop her healing spell to give plus five health to Damien, getting him back up to full. Because I can't think of what else to do with her, and it seems silly to just sit around waiting to use her healing spell. And I think her second action is just going to be to move into contact with the ghoul. Uh, and hope that, that it's enough to help Tywin uh, smack it away. With all that being said, that brings us to the end of the companion phase. Uh, and yeah, things not moving as, as swiftly as I would like. We are not getting, getting rid of enemies as quickly as I would like. And remember, we are going to have to put down a few more in this room over here. But with all that being said, we are at the end of the companion phase, so it is time for the deck of scary things, where we have drawn a red three. A trio of bright stars suddenly shines down through the dark clouds overhead. Choose one hero on the table to make a navigation roll. If successful, see note 199. Uh, Bryn is actually going to make this navigation roll because he just naturally has a navigation of plus two, I believe. Uh, well, actually, hold on. Let me check his stats real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. No, he he normally has a, a bonus to his tracking, not his navigation, but he is holding a book of navigation, which does give him a plus two. So he's going to need to crank a 10 or better. And he rolls a natural 20. So when it comes to skill checks, our guys are off the charts. Uh, it's just when it comes to fighting enemies that they don't know what to do. So Bryn here has passed his navigation check so let's see da, 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 looking at note in 199 you recognize the stars of as three of those that make up a famous four star constellation strangely the northeastern star is missing gain eight xp so by passing that navigation check we've gained our first xp of the of, of the scenario uh, but with that being said, that brings us to the end of turn two. I'm going to go ahead and get that treasure room set up for you guys. And I will see you guys at the start of the next turn. All right, heading into turn three here. The board is still looking pretty crowded. More crowded with enemies than I would like, even with us getting a bit of a break from the deck of scary things. And we're going to go into the ranger phase, group activating with Eliza and Damien, and oddly enough, we're actually gonna start off with Eliza, even though she has a dagger and plus nothing to her fight, she's gonna try to get rid of this ghoul, see if we can't just roll, spike a roll with her. So she's gonna be getting the gain bonus from Tywin at least, so she'll have a fight plus one against the ghoul's fight plus two. 
Um, okay. So she has rolled a total of a 12. The dagger gives her minus one damage. So she does win, but she only causes one point of damage. And we're going to force the ghoul back an inch to get him out of combat. Uh, because I think that could be useful. And then for Tywin's first action, he's going to... I think he's going to pop his frenzied attack ability, which is going to give him a plus five to his attack roll. Because we need, we just, we need to get this snake away from us. Uh, so the snake has a fight of plus two, so Tywin will now have a fight of plus ten. Tywin, do not screw this up. And of course he's about to roll a natural one. No, the opposite. He rolls a twenty, becomes a thirty, becomes thirty-five points of damage. Yeah, that's a dead snake. So as this snake has come rasping forward towards him, uh, he, he sees this ghoul uh, coming in, about to lay claws into him, just as Eliza bashes into its side with her dagger, causing little real damage to it, but showing great spirit and tenacity, bashing the, 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 ghoul, the ghoul snake out of the way. And then for uh, Damien's first action, he's actually going to move six inches towards Gwyneth because we need her to not get jumped on by a trio of, uh, of ghoul rotters. And then uh, her second action is going to be to nope, 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 back over here by, the, uh, by the, this fallen pillar where she has said, oh, oh my god, I just did something insanely brave. I'm never doing that again and runs away. Uh, and, Dame, and Tywin, for his second action, is just going to pop into combat with that ghoul just to make sure none of his friends have to, have to worry about it. Um, and then Damien actually does have a second action here, so he's just going to move another three inches into... Uh, actually, no, he's not. He's just going to stay there. He's going to stay there and, and have Gwyneth help him out. Uh... Actually, he, he is going to move just slightly forward to make sure he is the target of their attacks. So, which, yeah, never mind. He's just going to pop in there. He sees, he sees Gwyneth uh, recoil back from the doorway, letting out a shout of surprise. And as the snake is, the ghoul snake was rearing up ahead of him, he was kind of had his attention divided between and Damien, or Tywin just comes in there with his sword flashing back, cutting off the snake's head in a single blow, looks at Damien as if to say, pay attention, and then gestures for him to go off to help, help Gwyneth. As Gwyneth stumbles back from the door, Damien comes rushing through to find the, the three ghoul rotters waiting for him. And he says, ah, yes, a challenge. But with that being said, we, are, we do have to start off with the closest enemies, which is going to be the ghoul in combat with Tywin, who is going to just launch an attack at him. It's going to be fight plus two to Tywin's fight of plus five. I do still have a charge in his shield of brightness, but I don't really see the point in doing that right now. Uh, yeah, particularly when Tywin rolls like that. So Tywin has apparently remembered how his sword works. Uh, and, uh, has, or more realistically, has remembered where the sweet spot on his sword is. Uh, and as he's looking at, he kind of looks over at the, de at the decapitated corpse of the, of the ghoul uh, snake, turns to see the, the writhing form of the ghoul that, gets, that is getting up to try and pursue Eliza, and he just shakes his head in, in frustration as he dash, dashes forward, and with a single mighty swing of his sword, you know, his plus five, getting him up to a 23, uh, he, come, he comes, brings a single swipe of the sword down on the ghoul's head, chopping it off with a, in a fountain of, of already, uh, what's the term? Coagulating blood. Mm. Seeing the body, the cor its corpse drop to the floor. And that brings us to the end of that. Uh, but then this flinger is going to be chucking uh, another stone at Gwyneth because she's the closest uh, hero model and there's not really any reason why he would attack anyone else. So yeah, he's, he's going to have a shoot plus one against her fight of plus zero because she's so close and out in the open. Uh, oh dear. And he does end up rolling a 13. She only has an armor 11, so she's going to take two points of damage, dropping down to eight health. Or, sorry, no, dropping down to nine health, because she has uh, she has leveled up from her progression points, so she has 11 hit points, not 10, which is definitely not in any way complicated to remember. And then the ghoul is, I guess, just going to... 
move into base contact with her because he can't make another attack, but doesn't really have a reason to move away. Uh, the second ghoul is now going to chuck a rock at Tywin, the fool, with his shoot of plus one against Tywin's fight of plus five. Uh, let's see. Both of them have scored a 12, which normally would still... A tie would normally cause damage, uh, but Tywin's armor is a 12 because he has light armor and a shield, so as he's uh, kind of shaking his head at, at, at the decapitated ghoul, he turns around just in time to see a brick yeeted at him from, from, a, from this other ghoul and gets his shield up just in time to bash it away from him. But with all that being said... Tywin is going to be unharmed, and then we have to go into the awkward part of this, where Damien is now going to have to find out if he can outfight three ghoul rotters. As the, first, as the closest one rushes in towards him, more than enough room to get to him in a single round of combat. Let me remind myself. So ghoul rotters do have an arm, a fight of plus one. Damien will have a fight of plus three. So let's see if Damien can't, can't come out on top here. No, the 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 uh, rotter rolls a nineteen becomes a twenty. Damien, uh, with his armor of twelve, takes eight points of damage down to two. Oh dear, this may have been a horrible idea. Oh no, uh, the second ghoul rotter is gonna come in and now with a fight of plus two against his plus three. Uh, Damien. Okay, Damien seems to have turned it around. So the first ghoul rotter comes yeeting across across the, the this small room with far more velocity than Damien was prepared for. He just gets his shield up, but gets his head bashed against the wall of the room quite hard. He's seeing stars, dazed from the ferocity of the first rotter's attack, just in time to notice that, that there's another rotter coming at him. Uh, and he manages, and doesn't even, he's so dazed and confused from the first blow, doesn't even really know what he's doing, just sticks his sword straight out at the oncoming rotter, getting himself, rolling himself a 17, which becomes a 20, becomes 25 points of damage, more than enough to get rid of this second ghoul rotter. Uh, and then, unfortunately for Damien, uh, even as this rotter impales itself on his sword, there's another rotter coming at him from the other direction. Damien starts to notice it, it, it's it's lithe, kind of semi-decayed form coming towards him. Desperately starts trying to pull his sword from the corpse of, of the second roller, even as he's using his shield to keep away the first one. But does he get it out in time? Let's find out. No, Damien goes down. The second rotter comes in. He doesn't get his sword out in time with the rotter rolling a natural 20, bashing him over the head with its claws as Damien falls to the ground. What happens to him? He rolls a 16 on his out-of-action table, so he's going to make a full recovery. He's going to be just fine, but he is removed from play. He will not be getting a progression token this game. That is our second companion to go down. That is bad news for us, guys. Um, but okay, with all that being said, uh, that actually does bring us to the end of the companion phase? Yeah. Or no, creature phase. It brings us to the end of the creature phase. Into the companion phase, uh, Gwyneth is gonna make an attack against the ghoul flinger, the wounded ghoul flinger, who needs to keep his wound marker with him. Now, her bone sword does give her plus one to fight against undead. So she will have a fight plus one to the flinger's fight of plus one, so dice even. And Gwyneth does all right. She rolls a 17 to the ghoul's five. They're both plus one, so she's going to have an 18, more than enough to finish this ghoul. So uh, she gets cocked in the head with, 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 with a brick as, as Damien is getting jumped on by all these ghouls. But she turns just in time to see the ghoul rushing towards her and just lashes out with her bone sword, getting a lucky blow across his throat, across his neck, kind of... With the sharpness of that bone sword, it, it, it just barely slips under the weird little bone helmet that he's wielding and gashes his, his neck completely open, his head kind of lolling to one side as, it, as his corpse just kind of skitters past her, the momentum of his run carrying him in, into the corner of the room. Uh, but Gwyneth, her second action is going to be to get the hell out of there because I just cannot see a reason why she would want to stick around she is not the heroic type. She is not going to try to avenge Damien. Gwyneth runs over here and saying, Hey, Tywin, you should really worry about that. 
Uh, and with all that being said, we come over to Archibald, Bryn, and Bruno. Uh, Archibald and Bruno are going to be pretty easy to figure out. Archie is just going to make a nine inch move towards the this investigation marker. He's going to end up like there, but we're just going to rest him over here so he doesn't fall over. Bruno, again, stick it sticking close. Now Brain is going to have a bit more of a, a complicated choice. He could shoot at this ghoul flinger or he has also seen his his good buddy Damien go down. Uh, I'm going to have him choose to 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 light up the the ghoul that is like right smack dab in the center of the doorway that's literally like leaning in to to snack on Damien's unconscious form. Uh, I'm going to call that as having no cover because it's pretty much a straight shot from Bryn to that uh, ghoul. It's like right out in the open. So I am going to call that no cover. And so he's going to have a shoot of plus two against the Rotter's fight of plus one. But he rolls a four, so it doesn't matter. So even with this plus two, it's not even going to be close to enough to deal with the armor of that Rotter. So he fires off another shot. And his aim is just off today, and his, his shot just bounces off the archway of the door. Uh, and his, his first action had to be to reload, so that was actually his second action, which is unfortunate. And that is going to bring us to the bottom of turn three. Things looking a little rough. The party's getting kind of smacked around a little. And Gwyneth keeps forgetting her wound marker. Uh, but with the end of the turn, we do come to the deck of scary things. Which brings us a red five. What does red five do other than stand by? Uh, a large ghoul carrying a bag of bones climbs up the wall onto the ledge, place a ghoul flinger up on the, upon the ledge. Oh no, Archibald, bad timing. So just as Archibald is getting himself up those stairs, Lo and behold, a ghoul flinger kind of emerges from that coffin laying at the top. Oh, Archie, you have the worst timing. But that will bring us to the end of the turn, and I will see you guys at the start of the next one. Kicking off turn four, we're just going to hop right into the ranger phase with Tywin group activating with Gwyneth. Gwyneth is going to take her first action moving seven inches up onto the, uh, onto the dais, activating the investigation marker there, which is investigation marker B, which is large mounds of rubbish that are mostly comprised of broken chairs, statues, torn vestments, and abused prayer books, uh, litter the dais. Make an ancient lore roll, target number 10. If successful, see note 818. So she's gonna need to make an ancient lore roll, which she has no training in. And she's going to need to crank a 10 or better. So she does with a 12. We are just Johnny on the spot with our ability checks. So we are going to hop over to uh, note 818 and see what we can see. Okay, 818. Amongst the heaps of trash, you happen to notice a small book bound with golden clasps. You recognize the book as a rare and holy text. This book may be given to any hero and counts as an item. Whenever the hero carrying the holy book is in combat with an undead creature, it receives plus one armor. If the heroes still have the book at the end of the mission, it must be turned over to their superiors, where we will gain 10 XP for doing so. Okay, so Gwyneth is just going to hold on to that, and so she's now going to have a holy book of plus one armor against undead. Uh, I'm going to have to mark down that we're going to have another 10 XP waiting for us. Now, Tywin, on the other hand, is going to use his 7-inch move to start getting closer to that ghoul flinger. Because there is another investigation marker that away. So he's going to end up like so. And then his second action is just going to be to actually get into combat with the flinger. Because if he's going to have to fight it, he might as well do so on his terms rather than letting the flinger just take shots at him. Uh, as for Gwyneth's second action, uh, I mean, I guess she's going to make a three and a half inch move down these stairs. And end up like so. Okay, yeah, we're just going to have to rest her at the bottom of the stairs. Cool. Uh, and then that's the ranger phase. So onto the creature phase. Ooh, I'm not loving what that's going to look like. 
I'm gonna put Gwyneth's wound markers. Uh, we're gonna have to start, start off with the Flinger in combat with Tywin. It's gonna be fun. So Tywin is seeing the threat before him, see, seeing the decapitated form of the other Flinger, not want, wanting to be outdone by his party's rogue who is swiftly running away from the unconscious Damien. He rushes towards the other ghoul flinger coming around the stairs. Uh, shield at the ready as the and realizing that the ghoul is going to have the initiative and get, and get the first swing in. The ghoul does so lashing out with its talons. Fight of plus 1 to Tywin's fight of plus 5. So Tywin has rolled an 11 which becomes a 16, which is gonna cause eight points of damage because ghoul flingers only have an armor of eight. But that is going to leave the ghoul flinger with two wounds remaining. Uh, and there's really no point in Tywin forcing it back because even if he did, the ghoul flinger would just use its second action to get back into combat with him. But then we are gonna have to come over to the ghoul rotter or ghoul flinger at the top of this staircase, which remember, Archie is actually on the stairs. We're resting him over here because it's annoying, but he's going to chuck a brick at, at Archie's face. Shoot plus one against Archie's fight plus nothing. Uh, oh dear, and uh, the creature gets a natural 20. Uh, so Archibald's going to take nine points of damage down to one. Oh dear. Archibald is down to one hit point, and then the ghoul is just going to rush forward into combat with him and with Bruno. Oh dear, this could be better. <laughs> Uh, and then coming over to the two remaining rotters in here, their nearest adversary is Eliza. Uh, and so they're, they're not close enough to actually attack her, but they are both close enough to get into melee range of her. So she's now double ganging up. He's getting ganged up on by two ghoul rotters, which is not great news for her. Things could be going taking a turn for the disastrous in the near future. Uh, on to the companion phase, it's, uh, uh, start off with Eliza, I guess. Uh, oddly enough, I don't know what to do with her. Actually, let's start with Bryn, because I think Bryn could maybe help her out. So, Bryn is just going to take a 7-inch move, which is just enough to get him into combat with the closest rotter. And he's going to make an attack roll. He's going to be fight plus 2 against the rotter's fight plus 1. There we go. Clearly, Bryn is, is useless with his musket. He's actually a melee guy. So his fight plus two gets him up to a 19, but he does minus one damage, getting down to 18. Because he's, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, when he's using his musket as a melee weapon, we have to count it as a quarter staff, which does minus one damage. It also gives him minus one damage when he takes damage in melee. But in this case, it just does minus one damage to his enemy. But that's still 18 damage, which is exactly enough to kill the Rotter, because it has an armor of 8 and a health of 10. So down goes that Rotter. So apparently, uh, the Rotters uh, took a, have downed Damien, but as they were getting ready to bite into him, uh, the, the gunshot ricocheting off of the doorway was enough to distract them. They noticed Eliza standing there looking rather scrumptious and rushed towards her. Damien realizing there was no, or Bryn realizing there was no time to reload, hefted his, his, his musket and just ran full tilt towards the rotters, bashing one's head open with the, with the buttstock, uh, sending it collapsing to, to the ground with its head bashed open. However, Eliza is now going to have to fight the other one all on her own with a fight of plus nothing against a fight of plus one. She does manage to win that fight. Uh, she doesn't do any... Oh, actually, no, she will end up doing one point of damage to it because she's rolled a 10, but the dagger does minus one damage. So it's only going to be nine. It has an armor of eight. So she's going to do exactly one point of damage, getting it down to nine wounds. But she can force it back and then retreat behind Bryn. Or I guess technically she could run forward towards this door and try to deal with that treasure chest, see if we can't get something out of all of this mess. Okay, now we have to come over to the one I'm actually scared about. We're gonna have to deal with Bruno and Archibald in combat with that, uh, with that um, ghoul flinger. Yeah. So we're gonna start off with Bruno, who is gonna have a gang up bonus of fight plus one against the flingers fight of plus one. Or sorry, no, flingers have a fight of, 
No, yeah, fight of plus one. So flingers have a fight of plus one, so it's going to be even dice. Oh dear, and uh, Bruno takes a beating. 16, armor of 11, so he's going to take five points of damage going down to five, I believe five. Uh, our, our party's getting a little messed up here. And then uh, Archibald is going to use his first action, because Bruno now can't do anything. Uh, Archibald's going to use his first action to, I guess, try to fight the 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 flinger. Uh, he does have, um, he does have another spell. Yeah, and that's what he's going to do. He's going to activate his last spell, which is an area attack. It's the burning light spell. So I guess as he's been smashed over the head with a rock and Bruno has leapt bravely in front of him to grab the flinger's arm to stop from, from it from killing him, he extends his torch towards the, towards the flinger and get the hell away from my dog. And as the torch roars to life with the, with the light of St. Amelia burning through it, uh, he now gets to make a plus three attack against against the flinger who will only have a fight of plus one okay and the spell works so yeah the the light of the torch imbued with the holy energies as as as, as archibald is desperate to save his newly found his newly found pupper uh, the light of, of the of the torch causes the flinger to roar back in agony dealing a total of let's see 27 points of damage more than enough to kill that flinger. So that brings us to three dead flingers. Uh, I think two dead rotters. Or no, so we only have two dead flingers so far. Two regular ghouls, two rotters. Yeah, and two fiends. So yeah, two of everything except the snake. Uh, but then going over to... Um, actually, going over to nothing, we still have Archibald's second action where he's just going to move his six-inch move up the stairs and into that investigation marker, which is investigation marker C. All that remains of the second story is a small ledge of planking upon which rests a nicely carved box. Make an acrobatics roll of 12 or a climb roll of 8 to get up the ledge. Players may attempt these rolls as many times as they wish. Okay, so Archie is going to attempt his climb roll uh, as he's moved up the stairs and kind of trying to make the last desperate leap up the uh, ledge. We're going to go for the climb roll because he doesn't have bonuses to either of these. So it's going to be a target number eight, and he rolls himself a ten. So Archibald has successfully climbed up onto the ledge after burning away uh, the, the flinger. So I like to imagine that the flinger has retreated up the stairs, its body alight with holy flame as it collapses to the ground, and Archibald comes climbing up over it, shoving its corpse off the stairwell as it comes up, up to, to whatever treasure awaits him. And so yeah, and he just, according to this, he just gets a treasure token. So that's going to be one treasure token for Archibald. Uh, and Bruno's second action had to be wasted because it was stuck in combat. And they're both looking pretty rough. Uh, pun not intended. As good as, as good as it was. Uh, and then at the end of turn four, we have... Ooh, the Shadow Deep table card. The Club's Seven. So let's see what that brings us. Club 7, a swirling darkness suddenly coalesces into a Shadow Knight. Place the Shadow Knight in the center of a randomly determined table edge. The Shadow Knight follows all the standard rules for an evil creature. Whenever a figure moves into combat with the Shadow Knight, or the Shadow Knight moves into combat with them, see note 435. Awesome! So I'm going to have to go find myself a Shadow Knight model. Uh, but let's determine a table edge. Let's grab ourselves a D4. Uh, we'll call this table one and move clockwise four so it's going to be over here next to Bryn fun stuff this could only end well thank you so much guys for reminding me how to use the shadow deep table Woo! but with all that being said that does bring us to the end of turn four and hopefully we can start to turn things around in the next one okay getting started in turn five things are looking pretty rough uh, we've got Bryn about to be ganged up on by a Shadow Knight and a Ghoul Rotter. Uh, Tywin tied up in combat with a Ghoul Flinger, not close enough to group activate with anyone. And Archie and Bruno looking pretty rough for their wear. 
We're just gonna have to hop into the ranger phase and hope that Tywin can deal with this ghoul flinger once and for all, having bashed its first attack aside with his shield and, and pommel struck it over the head. Maybe he can bring his sword down in a mighty swing with his fight of plus five against the ghoul flinger's fight of plus one. Okay, yes, and Tywin has rolled a natural 20 uh, just when we needed it to, oh, camera. Uh, has rolled himself a natural 20, uh, and yeah, more than enough to finish off the two wounds left on this ghoul flinger. So as, as I was saying, he, he rushed forward, bashed the first attack, the ghoul's attack aside with his shield, pommel striking him over the head uh, as his arm extends over to the left, bringing it back across to decapitate the, the ghoul flinger. And with that, he is now just going to make a seven inch move coming this way to come help out because he is no longer in interested in investigation markers. He is only interested in trying to keep his companions alive, which unfortunately is going to bring us to the creature phase. But I do think now the creature is going to be closer to Tywin than Bryn and is going to charge forward towards him. Um, Tywin, I like to think that Tywin has slashed the head off of this uh, uh, ghoul, Look, looks around to assess the situation, sees Bryn being uh, surrounded by enemies, having bashed open the head of a ghoul flinger, and lets out a roar of no, and rushes forward. The, the, the volume of his roar, enough to draw the attention of the ghoul rotter that has been bashed aside by, by a fleeing Eliza. So Tywin is going to have his fight of plus five against the ghoul's fight of plus one, because it is just a rotter. Okay, uh, he does win that fight, and with a plus five, he's going to have a total of a 17, which is going to be exactly enough. Uh, the one damage that Eliza did was exactly, ended up being just enough, as this ghoul is kind of staggering up from being knocked over with a knife wound in its belly. It looks up just in time to see Tywin coming roaring in as he just shoves the point of his sword down through his neck, into his, uh, through his abdomen, and out through his backside. Uh, the rotter <laughs> just goes limp on his blade as Tywin uses a boot to force him off. Uh, but then the only remaining enemy on the table, the Shadow Knight, moves into combat with Bryn because he he, he is he is completely uh, unimpressed by Tywin's heroics. Just looking at him like whatever, I'll deal with you in a minute. You're next. Uh, but now that he has moved into combat with Bryn, we have to check a note. Uh, note four, three, five, I believe. Uh, hold on, let's recheck that. Club seven, yeah, check note four, three, five. Da, 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 da. The Shadow Knight turns out to be an illusion. Immediately remove it from the table. Wow, screw you, game. Joseph McCullough, you asshole. Why would you write that into this scenario? Just random Shadow Knight shows up. Oh, but never mind, psych, it wasn't really there. Ah, oh, you dick. Oh my goodness, that was the worst trick to play on me. I was so terrified because I was literally, guys, you need to understand, I was pouring, between the turns, I was pouring over everything in my inventory, everything in, in, my, in my party's abilities, and with Archibald having used up all of his spells, I had nothing. We were tapped out. There was literally nothing we could do to deal with this Shadow Knight, at least effectively. Oh, God, that is such a mean trick to play. But anyways, it's all worked out for the best. Uh, Tywin has dealt with the ghoul, and uh, Bryn is safe for now. Uh, but on to the companion phase. I don't particularly feel like finding out what else this game has in store for me, so Archibald is just going to make a 9-inch move, uh, double move headed for the exit. He's getting out of here, Scoob. Uh, Bruno, being best boy, is going to do much the same, but sticking close to Archibald just in case something happens. Uh, we still have investigation markers to, to check, so Gwyneth is going to make a ten and a half inch double move back towards the the room where Damien went down, feeling a little guilty, feeling like, okay, uh, turns out 
Uh, Archibald didn't need me. She's make, been making a big show. Oh, guys, no, I was checking on Archibald. I was trying to, trying to save him. It, it, I definitely didn't abandon Damien. Not at all. Not even a little bit. I totally didn't turn my back on him. And then Eliza is just going to make a real quick nine-inch double move up towards this investigation marker. Not quite getting there. And Bryn is just going to reload his musket and then retreat back between him, Tywin and Gwyneth. And that is going to bring us to the end of the turn. Things looking a lot better than they were a second ago. Uh, I was not feeling it, so... Man, I am so glad that Shadow Knight turned out to be an illusion. Uh, that's such a mean note, though. Like, why would you do that to me? Anyways, we have reached the end of turn five, and so it's now time for the deck of scary things. What other mean pranks is it going to play on me? <laughs> we have a red four. A ghoul rotter suddenly lunges out of the shadows. Randomly select one hero. That figure must make a survival roll at target number eight. Eight. If it fails, place the ghoul rotter in combat. If it succeeds, I can place it anywhere within three inches of the randomly determined hero. So we have two, four, six heroes on the table, and we're going to go left to right with a d6. Four, so that's one, two, three, four. Hey, uh, uh, Bryn ends up being the person making the survival roll. That is weirdly well timed. Because uh, he has a plus five to survival, so he just needs a three or better. And he gets a seven. Excellent. So we're just going to put a quick ghoul rotter down. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, so, right. Actually need to put it on the table, guys. What the... So we're just going to put it like that real close to Tywin because, yeah, I feel like seeing that ghoul rotter get stomped out by an angry ranger. Uh, but, yeah, that's going to bring us to the end of turn five. Is it really only turn five? Five out of eight. So we're, we're a little over halfway there. And, uh, yeah, I will see you guys at the start of the next turn. All right. Starting off in turn six, we've got Tywin with... Uh, a ghoul rotter kind of dropping down. I like to think of it, again, with the kind of horror element of this dark, dingy chapel, I like to think that the this rotter has, like, dropped down from some of the overarching remnants of, of the ruined tower from the higher levels and has dropped down right behind Tywin. But Tywin, having decapitated or impaled the previous ghoul and then watching the Shadow Knight in, uh, kind of evaporate away with a, with a low, menacing, evil chuckle. <laughs> he, turn, he, he hears the ghoul plop down on the ground behind him and is just super not having it. First action is going to be to move into base contact, and we're not even going to group activate with anybody. Yeah, we're just going to have him move in there and immediately make a plus five melee attack with uh, uh with his sword kind of uh, he, he finally kicks the 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 previous ghoul rotter off his sword here's another ghoul rotter plop down behind him kind of rolls his eyes with a dramatic sigh and just lashes behind him with a dramatic swing of his sword fight plus five against fight plus one and yeah he ends up with a 15 uh is his, so he doesn't quite kill the rotter but it is going to be enough to force it... Eh, no, nah, we're not going to force it back. He's just, but he is going to cause some pretty heavy damage to it. So it, he so it kind of lets out a dramatic slash of his sword, taking off most of the ghoul's head, but just high enough that like he, you can see the, the coagulated, decaying brains underneath where it's to the top of its skull used to be as it just kind of takes a dazed step back and looks at uh, Tywin, letting out a, a moan. And that's just going to take us right into the creature phase, where the creature is going to swing back. Another fight plus five against fight plus one. Uh, this time the rotter actually comes out on top, but not enough to do any damage. So as Tywin slashes his sword across, bashing off the top of the rotter, of the ghoul's head, it kind of staggers back for a second, lets out a, a, a bit of a dazed groan, then lunges forward at Tywin, who, surprised by the, by the creature's resilience, he just barely gets his sword and shield crossed in front of him to block the creature's attack. Uh, and is kind of straining his legs to try, to try and keep it off of him. And then, uh, that's the end of the creature phase, because the rotter is the only thing on the table, so Bran is just going to move right in. 
and try to uh, uh, seeing the threat, not wanting to risk a musket shot with his with his l faith, his brave and true leader. So Brynn's just gonna rush in there. His normal fight of plus two becomes a plus three because of the gang up bonus, because the rotter doesn't even see him coming. Again, much like Tywin heard the rotter plop to the ground and hefted his musket just in time to see Tywin engage the creature. Ooh, uh, ends up being a tie score, which means they're both gonna take some damage. Actually, no. Uh, Ty, uh, uh, Brynn is not gonna take any damage because he has, uh, yes, he is. He, he, he has an armor of 11 with no shield, but he does have light armor. Uh, his corner staff does give him uh, minus one to incoming damage as, as well to outgoing damage. So he, uh, if I can find, is going to go down to 12 wounds because he has a total of 13. But his fight of 13 is going to cause, uh, goes down to 12 damage because, again, minus one damage from the quarterstaff. But this, ro this ghoul is a rotter, not a normal ghoul. So it only has an armor of eight. So that 12 damage still does four damage going through, which is enough to kill the rotter. So, uh... Bryn sees Tywin struggling with, with this creature, kind of leaning for it, its teeth getting alarming and cl alarmingly close to Tywin's neck as its arms slowly force his defenses down, and Bryn comes dashing in to bash the creature over its semi-exposed brain, only to have the, the creature kind of kick out with a taloned leg, giving him a quick scratch through the leather of his, of, of his clothing. Uh, but the creature does go down with its head bashed fully open against the cobblestones of the chapel floor. Uh, and yeah, so that is going to be Bryn's two actions. We're going to come over to Gwyneth real quick, who's going to take her ten and a half inch move fully into the room that Bryn has successfully cleared of danger. Find to find Bryn unconscious. She does quickly check him to make sure he's alive, finding him breathing and more or less unharmed, but stabilizing him long enough for uh, for uh, Eliza to come check on him. Speaking of Eliza. She's going to move forward and check that investigation marker, which is going to be investigation marker... Da, 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 investigation marker D. A dark stained glass window, which in this case we're symbolizing with a giant statue, sits on the wall at, at this point. It is difficult to make out what it depicts in the gloom. Make a will roll. If the total of the will roll is 8 or greater, see note 901. If it's 12 or greater, see 214. If it's 16 or greater, see note 567. And uh, just because we haven't been able to do it yet, and I typically like to consider these in, the, in these scenarios the uh, investigation markers to be free actions, I am going to let her pop her strong will spell to give her a plus 5 to this, because normally she's only got a will of 1. So she's going to have a total of plus six to this roll, and we're looking to roll high. And she rolls a 12 with that plus six is going to give her an 18. So she gets the highest possible result. Uh, yeah, 16 or greater, see note 567. So let's go see 567. What does that mean for us? Du -du 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 -du. The hero suddenly has a vision of the window fully lit. It is a beautiful depiction of St. Emilia holding the decanter. She is pouring water and herbs and flowers are growing up all around her. The scent of rosemary and thyme fills the air. All heroes gain four lost points of health, gain 12 XP. I actually really dig that, guys. I actually think that makes a great, uh, a, a great addition to the to this game the fact that em eliza specifically was the one to find it walks up to this stained glass and we're probably having seen it a million times before has prayed in front of it countless times in her life sees it all shadowed in gloom feels a note of depression seeing all the horrible creatures dead on the floor around her seeing what used to be a wonderful glorious shrine to, to her patron saint and in the depths of her despair, suddenly the, the window bursts to life with light and color as she remembers every detail and everyone around her is suddenly healed. It, uh, uh, Gwyneth and Bryn going back to full health. Uh, Archibald going up to five. Uh, our faithful hound getting brought up to nine wounds. Uh, basically fully healed, will be fully healed at the end of this scenario, assuming he doesn't take any more damage. 
I actually really like that, guys. I love the narrative there. I'm actually really loving that. That it was Amelia and not anyone else. I was feeling a little silly about it a second ago, but I actually really like how that turned out. Uh, this game is... Th this mission pack has been so narratively pleasing the whole way through. I've just been super about it. Uh... So yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I've just been absolutely loving every second of it so far. Every, every scenario has ended up being like incredibly narratively satisfying. It always seems to take exactly the right twist to make, to make it the best version of itself. Joseph McCullough really outdid himself writing this, this mission pack. It has turned out so well. Uh, but yes, going on to finish the rest of our companion phase, Archibald is just going to continue his nine-inch retreat towards the table edge. Uh, even as he's starting to feel so much more lively and sprightly, he still wants nothing to do with this place that very nearly ended him, and more importantly, his faithful doggo, because we will not stand for that. Uh, but that does bring us to the end of turn six, which makes it time for the deck of scary things. Where we're going to get the eight of clubs. What does that have in store for us? Clubs eight. The heroes hear a deep growl, and suddenly a large wolf comes bounding in. Place the wolf in the center of a randomly determined table edge. The wolf follows all standard rules for an evil creature. Okay, so once again, we're going to have to turn to our D4. Once again, Archibald's edge will be the 1. And once again, we've rolled a 4. So the wolf is going to end up at the center of this table edge over here. And I will get that on the table in just a second for you guys. But I will see you guys in the next turn. All right, going into turn seven, out of eight, we're almost through this. And we have our very haunted, ghostly-looking, skeletal wolf. It's, I mean, it's just a wolf rules-wise, but I had this cool, spooky-looking one, so I figured I'd use that. I think it's in keeping with the very, like, Halloween, November, October theme we've got going on in the spooky haunt, the spoopy haunted uh, cathedral vibe we got going on for this, for this scenario. So hopping into the ranger phase, we are just going to have Tywin group activating with Bryn, and they are both just going to make seven inch movements into base contact with our wolf friend. Bryn is clearly not feeling it with the marksmanship today, so he's just going to pop in, granting Tywin a gang up bonus. So Tywin's second action is going to be to make an attack which just occurs to me, I need to check to see what the stats on a wolf are, because I did not have that prepped and ready. Okay, yeah, it's just a fight plus one, armor ten, six health. So fight plus one against fight plus six for Tywin. And I promptly dropped my dice. Sorry for the weird angle there, guys. Uh, but yes, seeing what we get, oh dear. Uh, that's going to be a once-per-game reroll if I ever saw one. Okay, yeah. So that is our hand. For, to clarify for those of you who are new, Tywin, another one of his heroic abilities that, he's, that he actually started off the, the campaign with was the Hand of Fate, which just lets you reroll any one dice rolled by a heroic, by a player-controlled model. So his two that he rolled becomes a nine, becomes... Oh, with a plus six, that's 25, 30 points of damage. Yeah, you only need 16 to, ki to kill the wolf. So down goes the wolf with a, with a mournful howl, and Bryn just kind of gets to stand there and also contribute. And he's just going to... I think Bryn is just going to start making his way towards the edge of the table. He's going to move three and a half inches this away. But coming... We don't have any more enemies for a creature phase, so we're just going to have Gwyneth pop over to the chest and try to make a traps roll. So she's going to try to make her traps roll. She does have traps plus two, so she needs to make a ten or better. No, she takes four points of damage, or three points of damage, going down to, oh, eight wounds. So let's go ahead and get that D8 out. And she is now poisoned, which means she only gets one activation per turn for the rest of the game, which is unfortunate, but she does now have a treasure token. Okay, so with that all being said, we are going to come over to Eliza, who fresh with purpose from her religious experience with, with the stained glass window is, is now bounding back towards them, the rest of the party, nine inches. 
And then let's see, uh, Archibald is gonna be able to make it off the table. So he and Bruno are just gonna run for it off the table. They want nothing to do with this. They're out of here, Scoob. Shaggy and Scoob have left the chat. Um, that brings us to the end of the companion phase, which makes it time for the deck of scary things, where we have drawn the red two. What does that have in store for us? With a great cracking sound, several large stones stumble from the highest remains of the tower. Randomly select three heroes on the table and make a plus zero shooting attack against each of them. There are literally only four companions left, so we're gonna go from left to right with, we're gonna roll a d4 from, and go from left to right to find out which of them gets to avoid being hit. Uh, two, so that's gonna be Eliza, Everyone else is going to take a hit. So, Bryn, with your fight of plus two against a fight of plus zero. Uh, yeah, so Bryn rolls a total of a 20. He manages to shrug it off. Tywin is going to have his fight plus five against a fight plus zero. No, he actually is going to take some damage. He's going to take a total of four points of damage. But he's going to use an another one of his heroic abilities to cut that in half and only take two points of damage. So he's going to go down to 16 health, and we're just going to have to remember that. And then Gwyneth, with her fight plus nothing against fight plus nothing, let's see how she does. No, she takes another uh, seven points of damage down to one wound. Oh no, Gwyneth is looking rough. Okay, so that, that was actually kind of a rough one. We're not even going to bother marking Tywin's wound because... There's kind of no point. He's going to heal it at the end of the scenario, particularly with no enemies left on the table. So, and with that being said, we're just going to go ahead and pop into turn eight real quick, because that went by pretty quick. So, yeah, we're just over into turn eight, last turn of the game. Uh, there are no creatures on the table, so we're just going to kind of move everybody. Uh, Bryn has more than enough move to get him off the table. Uh, Eliza is just going to move nine inches towards the edge of the table. Gwyneth only has the one activation due to being poisoned, so she's gonna kinda limp her way out of the room, just kinda barely having the movement to get out there, calling out to Tywin for aid, even though, even as she helps, even as she helps prop up Damien's unconscious form, dragging him out. Tywin, uh, Tywin's gonna be a stand-up dude and just kinda come over here and play Guardian. And then we're gonna flip over the last card from the deck of scary things which is a red six a pair of ghouls crawl out from a hole in the ground and place two ghouls directly beneath the ledge over here uh i mean we're not even gonna bother because even if i give it another turn they're so far away they're under the ledge because that is meant to be a ledge uh yeah they're so far away there's literally nothing anyone can do our ranged character is gone they're too far away to get to us by the end of the turn. Yeah, that's that's going to be the end of the game. Turn 8 is, is going to end up being kind of much ado about nothing. Uh, but with that being said, we have reached the end of the scenario. It was kind of a rough one. We got smacked around a bit. Uh, Eliza kind of coming in clutch with, 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 with spiking that roll with her spell on the... Stained glass window healing us up a bit, although Gwyneth uh, still not feeling super hot. Uh, and yeah, at the end of the tur at the end of the game, uh, Archibald is gonna go back up to. Uh, let's see, he was at six health or five health. So he's gonna go up to eight out of eleven. Uh, Bruno's just gonna heal. Gwyneth is just gonna reset to let's see six health. Uh, and everyone else is just sort of fine. Everyone else, or Damien's only going to be at six health as well. So Damien and Gwyneth going to be at six health. But other than that, everyone's going to be looking pretty solid. But yeah, that does bring us to the end of the scenario. I will calculate up our experience points and I will see you guys in the outro. Well, there you have it, folks. Another game of Rangers of Shadowdeep in the bag. We managed to get ourselves through the ruined chapel without too much trouble, even if... Gwyneth and Damien are not going to be feeling great in the next scenario, but uh, not a lot to report in terms of the actual core mission. 
uh, you know, it was one of those weird things where the gatehouse intuitively led us to the court to the courtyard. The courtyard gave us clues leading us to the library. The library had a clue leading to the herb store. The chapel didn't really give us anything. The, the chapel didn't really give us much in the way of clues. We had a kind of religious experience with the stained glass window, but other than that, all we really achieved was killing a bunch of ghouls. Uh, which, don't get me wrong, is good fun and everything, and we did level up. So that's something. We reached level 8 with Tywin, which means we gain another heroic ability for a total of 6 now? Because he started off with 4, or earned one another one at level 5, Four and got another one today. So I gave him the powerful blow heroic ability, which says that once per game, when he does, when he makes an attack that causes at least one point of damage, uh, like true damage, like after armor, after you subtract the armor and all that, he can then once per game add an additional three points of damage. Uh, situationally, kind of useful, but we're also kind of running out of heroic abilities to give this guy that make any sense for him uh other than that not a lot to say other than we did have a pair of treasure tokens that we had to resolve one we just rolled uh golden jewels which is you can either give a companion a progression point or gain 10 xp i went with the 10 xp because progression points are just it takes so many for them to make a difference that i just don't even bother um the only other thing to say, oh, the other treasure token ended up being a magic item, which was pretty exciting, because I don't think I've rolled one. I've rolled magic weapons, which is how I got the shield of brightness, but this was the first magic item we rolled. And it ended up being a spell ring, which basically you just go to the spell section, pick one, assign it to the ring, and you get one free use of that spell from whichever character is holding the ring. So I gave the ring to Tywin, and I made it a, a ring of teleportation. So he's going to have one use of the teleportation spell just because it was so useful the last time I had it. Uh, it really came in handy, and movement in this game is kind of clutch. So feeling pretty good about that. Feel, feeling pretty happy about out, uh, finding that ring. All in all, could have gone worse, could have gone better. We could have found the decanter, and I'd feel, be feeling pretty great about myself right about now. As it stands, I still think the herb store is the best bet, but we are going to keep playing through the other rooms. Oddly enough, even though we have four scenarios left, we only have one option of where to go, because the fourth scenario is the finale, and two of the other scenarios are on the second floor of a building, so we have to go through the hospital ward to get to the other two scenarios. So we actually don't have any options about where to go next. So next up, we will be checking the hospital wing, or hospital ward, I forget which, which it's called, but anyways, that's what we'll be seeing next week. But in the meantime, I just want to just thank you guys for, for watching this far in the video if you've made it this far. I know it's not always easy. Uh, just another quick reminder to maybe hit the like button, consider subscribing. We do have more of these gameplay videos coming every Friday, and we have hobby discussion videos mostly centered around, around 40k every Monday, so... Other than that, I would love to see you guys in the comments down below. I love hearing from you. I would love to see you on some of our videos going forward. But in the meantime, happy wargaming. Onward to glory!